you know, we see it as a taping service. You, you sense that because this is the only 20 minutes of that week that that person is going to be creative. Right. They do, there is this easy tendency to fall into of overdoing it because you want to pack all those years of your experience and your resume and your training and your real, you want to pack it all into that mm -hmm. 30 seconds of the audition. And for someone to tell you, no, nope, just throw it away. It, it mm -hmm. can be deflating and, uh, and actors uh, self-taping, that's, that's the danger is they don't have that voice telling them to, mm. you know, just be, keep it simple. Um, and, uh, and, and then that's how we kind of can sometimes uh, let our own craft get away from us. What's up, my fellow actors? Welcome to the Acting Career Center, here to help you learn the skills you need to break into the film and television industry. My name is Kurt Yu. Thank you once again for spending some time here with me today. If this is your first time here, make sure to subscribe to this channel to get more videos on acting, auditioning, and career advice every single week. I'm really excited about today's video because I interviewed my friend Matt Cornwell, who is a fellow actor and a fellow YouTuber. His YouTube channel for actors is called Get Taped. I highly recommend you subscribe to his channel as well. I'll put it down in the description below. I watch all of his videos and I think you should too. Matt and his wife Brooke run an audition taping service here in Atlanta called Get Taped. They also teach acting classes and workshops some of which are online via Zoom. So I know a lot of people have been asking me about online acting classes and I've shared a few options with you in the past. So here's another great option if you're interested in Matt's online acting classes, go on to gettape.com. I'll put that link down in the description below as well and check those out. So I had a great time chatting with Matt about various topics, including his YouTube channel and his taping service, as well as his classes, how he got into acting, and we both share our experiences working on the movie Venom back in 2017. So without any further ado, here is Matt Cornwell. Hey Matt, how's it going? Doing well, Kurt. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining me here on, on my YouTube channel. And one of the main reasons why I wanted you to join me was because I saw that you had started a YouTube channel as well uh, a couple months ago. Is that right? Yeah, we launched, uh, I think, right there first week of July, uh, end of June. Um, so your channel is called Get Taped, which is also the name of your taping studio here in Atlanta. So we'll talk about all of that uh, in a little bit. We'll talk about, obviously, your taping studio in a little bit. But um, let's start with your YouTube channel, Get Taped. I'll, I'll put the link down in the description for people to go check out. I highly recommend you uh, learn from Matt because he's a wealth of knowledge here in Atlanta. Um, so what what inspired you to start the YouTube channel? Well, uh, depending on what year people are watching this video, because this will, of course, live and, and continue to be watched right. over and over again for decades to come. Um, yes. Here in 2020, during this pandemic, um, I, I think a lot of creatives can sympathize with the, the ups and downs that everyone uh, uh, was subject to, especially in the early days of the quarantine when yeah, you know, the first week, everyone's like, oh, sweet, I don't have to do anything for a week, you know, and then that sort of gave way to, for I think a lot of people, um, very low points in their life. And yeah, creative, creatively speaking, and otherwise, um, not to at all even downplay the severity of, of what other people uh, experience. But it, just from a creative standpoint, went through a lot of ups and downs for those couple months. And uh, as I was starting to kind of come into an up uh, cycle, um, I started thinking about just, uh, I'd always wanted to do something in terms of putting content out there. And, and this was sort of the catalyst, the, the, the quarantine was the catalyst. We still didn't have an industry coming back yet. And I was just thinking of the different ways that to put stuff out there. And honestly, I'd seen your channel, I'd seen you sort of um, starting to put out content and, and I'd started um, uh, watching a lot of videos on the best ways to to put con out, content out there, how to edit your videos uh, for this sort of the YouTube uh, audience. And it just sort of all catalyzed together thinking, you know what, uh, there's a lot of stuff that we've learned as a taping service over 10 years. And, and my wife and I, we've, you know, we've been doing this collectively, uh, well, each uh, over 20 years each. Yeah. And uh, it just made sense that, that uh, because when I started, um, I took a class and, and was immediately sort of exposed to um, different 
free information, you know, from friends, from teachers and from other sources that so much of this information should be available for free to actors to avoid the scams and the heartaches and, and yeah. unnecessary obstacles, basically. Yeah. So that, um, was, that was the main impetus. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and similarly to me, uh, I, had, I had already started the YouTube channel years ago, and it had always been in the back of my head to you know, get back on, on it. And it, it was the pandemic, the same thing, you know, had nothing to do for a while. And, and I thought, you know, it, if I'm going to do it, you know, this is the perfect time because we have the time. And I'm honestly, that's a kind of a silver lining for me about the whole pandemic was that I've gotten this started. I've also been consistently putting out the videos, whereas when I first started my channel back in like 2015, 2014, I wasn't very consistent with it. And then just, it just dropped off, you know, and, and I took like a five year hiatus from making videos. Uh, but now uh, I feel like, you know, fingers crossed, but I feel like once everything starts to pick back up again, I'm, I'm on enough of a, um, I've, I've been doing this enough that I can kind of stay on schedule and I've been consistent enough that hopefully I won't fall off the cliff <laughs> again. Um, but uh, let's, let's talk a little bit more about Get Taped since Get Taped is the name of your YouTube channel, but we, we said earlier, it's also the name of your taping service here in Atlanta. Uh, and you are one of the original taping services here in Atlanta. So how long have you been in business and uh, what, what got you started on doing the self-taping uh, for actors? Sure. Uh, well, Brooke and I, my wife, we, we formed the, the name Get Taped. We came up with that name and bought the domain, I think, in 2010 when we got married. Hmm. Uh, so the business itself, I could say, is 10 plus years old. But uh, our experience as audition tapers uh, extends back to 2005, where when she first moved to Atlanta, um, we were both uh, sort of, and she got with one of the agents here and I was with a different agent and, and we both just sort of fell into being asked to record the auditions that were being done in-house. Um, at the time, back in 2005, it was mainly like Army Wives uh, out in Charleston. And then you might occasionally have some other show that might be shooting regionally that, um, that, that just, that was allowing tapes. And, and so in the beginning, the early days, the uh, at the at its infancy, the self taping was all done at the agencies, and uh, because there wasn't that much of it, and then mm -hmm. as that started to grow, uh, and I was you know I was being paid sort of as a sort of part time worker to do that for my agency, and then as that started to grow, and it became clear to the agents locally that it was going to be too much of a strain on their resources to continue offering this as a service for their actors, they kind of uh, my agent uh, Houghton was one of the last ones to cave in mm. terms of saying we can't do this anymore for you because mm. they really did want to continue providing the service to to the talent um so in that sort of transition phase brooke had started sort of randomly taping friends every once in a while and then when we uh got married and moved in together it, it became sort of a thing we started doing jointly and when it started it was like he got one request a month and then one a week and at that time we were just charging 20 bucks for as long as you needed like it was just yeah. 20 bucks for a taping and sometimes people came and went uh, in 20 minutes. Sometimes it was an hour and a half and we're like, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, and then as that grew to like one a day, two a day, then we were like, okay, first of all, we need to move to a time-based structure for the, for the appointments. Um, and then it also became a little weird doing it out of our apartment, having, uh, it was a gate of the community and we had a one bedroom. And so you had to have people park and wait if someone else was already in there yeah. taping. And it was just <laughs> awkward. You, you had to buzz them in and then say, Hey, just wait in your car. And, neighbors are seeing these really beautiful people uh walking in and out of our apartment throughout the day <laughs> and it's just you know questions start coming yes. up um and uh, so then that became clear that we needed to kind of move to a different space so we we uh we found a, a more legitimate business space and and, and from there it's just kind of kept growing that's awesome yeah yeah that's a that's a really cool story and um i i've always i always wonder that so you were the in-house uh, like taping coordinator at Houghton uh, mm -hmm. when they were when they were doing it there. I, I mean, that was that's very similar to I mean, I guess that makes sense because before the film and television industry came to Atlanta um, and, and pretty much like settled here in 2008 ish. Uh, 
Atlanta probably was a very similar market to like a Cleveland, Ohio with um, where most of the work was local commercials, industrial videos, training videos and things like that. Right. And so my agent, my fir very first agent in Cleveland was the same thing, you know, taping in in-house. Uh, if you got an audition, you would go into the agent's office and they would tape you in their little taping studio. And, and, and I honestly, I remember because we have the same agent. So I remember when I uh, first came to Houghton and, and I was browsing their website and they would have, you know, how to self tape videos linked on there. And it was you explaining how to, how to do things. It's probably still up there right now. Um, but, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that makes it all, it's all come together now. It all makes sense why, uh, they linked your videos. Um, and, and it's, it's funny that you, you talk about like how, how your taping service grew because when I started, in Cleveland, I also, I started a taping service and I think it was the very first taping service in Ohio at, at the time. And because I was recording my own auditions and nobody else was offering it. So I just decided to, uh, to start it up and, and offer it in Ohio. And it, it was a similar thing when I came down to Atlanta, I decided I didn't really advertise it, but it was just like friends of mine that I knew. I would just tell them, hey, if you need an audition tape, you can always head over, uh, at, over to my place and I'll help you tape it. And at the time I was living at a, in a place up in Kennesaw, similar in a gated community, everything like that. And the other thing was that there was no, we really didn't have a lot of uh, uh, parking for guests in our community. So I had to tell, it was really awkward. It's like, okay, so you park at the Red Roof Inn. <laughs> Don't worry because they're not gonna, they're, they're, you're gonna see a sign where you park that it says they're gonna tow you, but they're not, I promise. <laughs> I've parked there for a year, uh, nobody's been towed. So, th so that's fine. And then come to the gate, uh, come to the car gate and stand there and dial and then I'll buzz you in. It was all a huge ordeal. Uh, to do that for people. So it's, it's uh, hilarious. I actually wanted to ask you, do you know uh, Alan O'Reilly? He's an actor. Oh, he was wow. with uh, Howden for, uh, I think he still is with them. Um, I'm sure I do. You know, okay. it's one of those things where uh, the name rings a bell, but um, don't have the face to match with it right in the top of my head. Kind of has like a Benjamin Franklin type of look. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so he... <laughs> Uh, he's from, he, from Atlanta, I, I believe when he was here, he, he was doing, um, a lot of Shakespeare and, and then also, uh, was repped by Houghton and he moved to Cleveland to become the artistic director at the Cleveland Playhouse, uh, not the artistic director, the education director at the Cleveland Playhouse. So when he moved to Cleveland, he was looking for someone to tape his auditions because he was still uh, repped by Houghton. And he found me and I was used to taping people for local commercials, you know, and for industrials. And he found me and when he came in, he gave me a, his audition sides for the originals. And I was like, what, <laughs> where are you getting this audition? Um, so he was one of the first people to tell me about Atlanta and what was going on down here because you know I was super naive to what's what was happening here and I think even even a lot of working actors still are not uh, really aware of how much work is is going on here in Atlanta how long have you been um, working here in Atlanta were you were you born and raised here or did you move here for the industry no you know I, I was um uh, I moved here for my graduate school for engineering. Oh, okay. So, uh, good, good times there. Like, yeah, I went to, yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, I went to Duke for my undergrad and then I came and I got my uh, bachelor's in mechanical engineering and then, uh, and I wasn't coming to, to graduate school school for any other reason than I was not sure what I wanted to do with life. So mm. I decided to delay my life decision by going to grad school. And because the interesting thing for those of you who might have gone to grad school for other uh, other subjects in engineering, you get paid to go to grad school. They pay you to do research. You uh, you get accepted and then you, you have to find an advisor who has grant money for different research projects. So you find a, a an advisor that you, you jive with and then you get assigned to a research project. And so while you're doing your classes and, and fulfilling your credits, you're also doing research on the side. So it was a thing where I wasn't accruing debt. In fact, I was making money 
but it was really just about not uh, making life decisions. And because right. at this at this point, you know, when I got to grad school, I had uh, done a lot of acting in high school, and then even at undergrad, I had while pursuing engineering, I was doing uh, uh, as many acting classes as I could fit into my electives, mm-hmm. and I really enjoyed it. My senior year, I did a, a film class. They had a a SAG actor, you know, guest guest teacher come in for the, you know, it was a film and television actor who came in and taught the class and, and even recorded our final scene work and said that he would send it to uh, like an agent in Charlotte. Um, And it was just like, what an agent, you know, like it was again, like you're talking about that naive thing of not even thinking that that was possible anywhere, but Hollywood. Um, And when I came to tech, uh, that's where I started to kind of actually did a lot of theater when at Georgia tech, which seems like an oxymoron, but it's not, they, they do some pretty good shows there. And, um, and, th- and then I started looking outside of school and I found the school, started taking classes. Turns out there was an agent or an assistant from Houghton who was in my class, who she didn't tell anybody, uh, but she came up to me a- after class one day. I said, hey, do you have an agent? Because I work for Houghton. She's like, don't tell anybody. Wow. And I said, I don't. She's like, well, uh, get some headshots and let me know when you do because I think you'd be good for Houghton. Wait, she was in so- what class? She was in your engineering class? No, sorry. I had started oh. taking an acting class. Oh, okay. Uh, was, okay. I missed yeah. that. I missed that transition into the acting class. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, that's what I meant by I started looking for stuff outside of, of, yeah. of um, the school. And, and I, meanwhile, I was working in corporate America for a couple of years uh, as an architectural consultant, and hmm. which really, it wasn't a full use of my master's degree. My boss at the time said, you're overqualified educationally hmm. for this job. And, but for me, it's like, I wasn't looking for a really... I, I wasn't looking to, to like work for Lockheed Martin as an engineer or anything like that. I was, I was looking for something a little softer and, and in, as an architectural consultant, one of the things we actually did was uh, design performance theaters. And so that was really cool to me. And, and oh, I yeah. thought it'd be a, thought it'd be a nice balance and realized after two years that corporate America wasn't for me. Um, and uh, both my boss and I looked at each other sort of at the end of that second year and we just kind of said, yeah, I think it's time to part ways. Wow. <laughs> it was, it was like, like such a mutual decision that yeah. never happens. Um, and, uh, but I was better for it because then at that point I'd had an agent for about eight months. Suddenly with all this extra free time, I was going to be looking for another job, but then with all the free time I was available and I started getting more auditions and, mm-hmm. and I thought, huh, let's just take that leap. And so then it became about scrounging for money anywhere I could with odd jobs and, um, and to try to make this work. And it took, of course, in that time, like you're talking about Cleveland being a small market, it was just your local commercials and right. just the industrials. You had one movie a year, maybe if you're lucky. Right. And the only TV was in Wilmington, North Carolina, or maybe somewhere else like New Orleans. Um, and so it was, it was very tough. Like my first year of acting, um, that first eight months, I should say, because I, I started with, with Houghton in May of 2002. Mm-hmm. And that first eight, eight months, I think I made five hundred dollars right yeah. uh, two jobs i booked that year and then i booked maybe three jobs in 2003 or right. yeah 2003 and but it wasn't a lot of money and uh so i was maybe making a thousand dollars that second year and uh so it was a really slow journey mm-hmm. a because i was so new and b the industry was still so small right and, and i can totally but, relate uh, to how you know the, the the mindset of uh an actor in a small market when that one big movie comes into town <laughs> per year and you get an audition, it's like, this is a game changer, right? And you're going to spend like four days working on your two lines uh, and, and, oh, and yeah. record it about 25 times. <laughs> <laughs> well, I let the, this is a great first, uh, first movie audition for me. Um, first of all, uh, I, I just, well, we'll do some name dropping here uh, for, for local market people. My sure. first audition ever. Uh, so like just a couple days after I'd gotten my headshots, um, that assistant, she calls me up. She says, I have this audition for you. It's at Stillwell Casting and it's for a national Zocor commercial. Um, and at the time, Dan Reeves, who was the coach of the Falcons, he was the spokesperson. So it was going to be a football commercial. Hmm. Well, it turns out I was actually auditioning to be an extra, but because they needed these guys to be, you know, to look like football players, they were actually holding auditions. Hmm. So my audition was with Melissa McBride of mm-hmm. Walking Dead fame. She was a casting director before she uh, was a famous actress. And, um, and so it was just a question and answer thing. And, and I booked it. And so I was one for one with commercials. And I thought, this is awesome. You know, <laughs> yeah. this, it, this industry is amazing. 
even though I only made whatever the SAG, you know, uh, extra rate was for that job. But then flash forward to 2003 and I have this movie audition for Bobby Jones, Stroke of Genius, starring Claire Filani and Jesus himself, uh, Jim Caviezel, right? He he had already done The Passion of the Christ. And so he was, uh, you know, had some notoriety at the time. And my audition was six words long and I had been training, you know, steadily for a year and a half. So I was going to squeeze three emotions out of those six words. <laughs> right. And <laughs> against all odds, I got a call back because, you know, that's just way too much. I mean, it, it was the, it was the exact thing I shouldn't have been doing in that audition, but I got a call back. So I come back in and it's the casting director, the director and uh, uh, the producer, like the executive producer. So I, and the line was, there's no way prohibition can last because it was the night before prohibition, a bunch of friends hanging out at a bar mm-hmm. and, and we're all talking about you know, uh, prohibition and this and that. And so my, my big line was, there's no way prohibition can last. So I do the line and I squeeze those two or three emotions out of it. And the director just kind of smiles. He, like he knows what I'm doing. Like this <laughs> right. little small town actor yeah. is just trying to win his Oscar. And, um, so he, he just, he goes, uh, that was great. Uh, just do it again. And just, just say the line, you know? And so I, I, so I did, I threw it away. I just said the line and, and he looks at his producer and goes, uh, the character name was chum. And so he looks at the, uh, the uh, executive producer goes, you think this guy looks chummy? Yeah. And the executive producer just goes, uh, yeah, he looks pretty chummy. The director turns to me and goes, you want to be in this movie? And I said, yes. And he goes, all right, you're in this movie. And I looked straight at the casting director to, to like from a contractual standpoint, like that was binding, right? You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's the, he can't just say that and then take it back. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, so that's now my first movie audition experience thinking I'm one for one with movies. Oh my gosh. You know, and it's like, this is easy. This is awesome. Yeah. And then, of yeah. course, no, not, not at all. Um, but it was just so funny how that happened. Like never do you get booked in the room because that in, no. either implies one, they didn't call anybody else after me. And because I was early in the morning for that callback session, it was like 930 in the morning. So it wasn't like they had a whole day of auditions. And um, so either there wasn't anybody after me or uh, they just didn't want to bother with it. And so the rest of those people who came in for chum either had no chance or they just sent them home. I don't know. I have no idea what what why they booked me in the room like that. But Mm. it was never to happen again. (laughs) 20 years later, it still (laughs) never happened again. Yeah. And it also, I mean, that that speaks to what I'm sure you and I and, and a ton of people have all learned uh, throughout the, the the course of our careers is is that you know a lot of it ends up coming down to the look that they were looking for. They were probably really loved your look and over overlooked, you know, you overacting for your original audition to give you the callback just to make sure, all right, can he take direction and do this the way we want it? And, and, and it just happened to work out. I have, I have a similar story and it was not my first audition. There was a very, this was actually very recently. <laughs> um, I, I did, I auditioned for um, the uh, John Stewart directed and Steve Carell starred uh, movie Irresistible. And I remember taping my audition for this character was also it was about it was more than six words but it wasn't much more it's maybe 10 (laughs) uh maybe a line and a half or something like that and because you know it's john stewart and steve carell i was like i'm gonna kind of joke around with this a little i'm I'm gonna have some fun with this line and uh i didn't i i don't think i went overboard with it but i still like you know uh brought brought some more personality to the line than maybe what they wanted so I, i i did that go into the callback and uh john stewart is there you know in the, in the callback so i was like oh man this is crazy go into the callback and do my line the way that i had done it in the audition and he goes okay yeah let's just uh just don't do anything with it just 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 say the words just say the words and and so i auditioned with my glasses off so i couldn't really see him I only see like the blur of him sitting, you know, like six feet away. And I just hear him saying that. And I'm like, oh, all right. So I just, I just do the words. And here's what I see. I, I, I see a blur of him six feet away. We're, we're still rolling. So I'm not looking over at anybody yet. But just out of the corner of my eye, I see the blur of Jon Stewart sitting there. Just go, just do one of these only because I was able to say the line without you know, doing too much with it. And 
Uh, obviously, after seeing that out of the corner of my eye, I felt pretty good walking out of the room. Uh, but yeah, some similar type of story. Um, yeah. Well, you know, uh, just to jump to some philosophical acting stuff real quick, you know, you know both of those uh, anecdotes really scream to, to, to the thing that, that you kind of were alluding to, which is, you know, casting directors or sorry, well, casting directors, but specifically the director, when they are now in the room and they've called you back because they've seen your tape, they've seen your headshot, maybe they've even seen your reel. If you've yeah. got, if you've got that, it, when you walk into the room, it is yours to lose. Like they are, they're all, they're already in this mode, right? right? They are already going, please don't mess this up. Right. And, and like, and like you're saying, in both of our cases, it was, we walked in with the job and all we could have done was on our own lost it. Like we didn't have to do anything to gain the job other than just relax and just kind of, just, just, you know, go with the flow or take the direction or whatever. And, and, and then it was ours. Like that, it was, it was meant for us. And, and even if you don't end up booking it, that's the only job in the room is to walk in and just not try to do more than what right. they need from you, which is just something authentic and simple. And, and, uh, you know, but, but when you only get a chance to act maybe once a week at an audition, if, if things mm -hmm. are going well, mm -hmm. maybe twice a week, if it's really booming, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, we see it as a taping service, you, you sense that because this is the only 20 minutes of that week that that person is going to be creative, right. they do, there is this easy tendency to fall into of overdoing it because you want to pack all those years of your experience and your resume and your training and your real, you want to pack it all into that mm -hmm. 30 seconds of the audition. And for someone to tell you, no, just throw it away. It, it mm -hmm. can be deflating and uh, and actors uh, self taping that's that's the danger is they don't have that voice telling them to mm. you know just be keep it simple um, and uh, and and then that's how we kind of can sometimes uh, let our own craft get away from us yeah and and from the self taping standpoint uh, also since a lot of these co star auditions will not have callbacks you know you don't you don't have that separate second opportunity to to get called back for them to just see if you can take that direction. They can only base it off of what you did in the audition. So that it's a kind of a double whammy to, to um, you know, not make sure you don't uh, make that quote unquote mistake. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. So uh, one more thing I wanted to touch on was that, so in both of our YouTube channels at the end of our videos, we both say, we'll see you on set. And we actually have not seen each other on set, but we've worked on a couple of the same projects. And one of the really cool ones recently was Venom back in 2017. Uh, I believe I saw you before. I didn't see you on set, but I think, uh, didn't, did I run into you during a fitting? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if you did, but I had two or three fittings for that because they kept changing the wardrobe uh, or what they wanted us to wear. Yes, I did have at least two, if not three. Yeah. Uh, so what was your experience working on uh, that, that giant, a giant blockbuster like Venom? You know, first I'll start with the audition where sure. um, just kind of talking about this, this type of stuff of, of in the room, because that was one of those ones where we taped, then we had a, or I think, either way, there was an in-person. Mine, mine was in person all the way. Like first, first maybe, audition was in yeah. person too, yeah. Yeah, maybe I'm just assuming that it was taped because everything else in this, yeah, in right. this uh, city is. But at the callback, it was one of those experiences where the director either had a long day or he was just a real chill guy because I walk in and he's just kind of leaned back and mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't standoffish at all. He's a really nice guy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he was, I, I did my, I don't even know if I did the take first. I think he just kind of chatted and he just kind of flipped my headshot over and was looking at it. He's like, ah, oh, improv. I, I love improv. Mm -hmm. And he's like saying with no enthusiasm, he's, he's <laughs> like, uh, is you know is, what's the scene like here in Atlanta and so I just kind of you know gave me the opportunity to talk about improv and yeah uh some of the stuff that I do and enjoy and blah 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 and you know he's just kind of nodding and you know you start to get the sense with people in general like if you're on on a first date you know you start to get that sense of whether or not there's a connection there and yeah. that is so much more important to me and to that director than than even the talent because it's like you know th they can get even someone with no experience to say a line. Mm -hmm. uh, and I only think I had two or three lines total. It's more about like, am I going to enjoy your presence on set? Are mm -hmm. you a, a, a reasonable human being and, mm -hmm. and fun to be around? And, and especially if it's a comedy, do you have some, some a sense of humor? 
And so I just kind of left that, you know, it was not that big of a deal. The scene was not uh, earth shattering. Um, but I kind of left going, okay, that was, there was definitely a connection there. So sure enough, I, I, I booked it and it was, it was cool. The, the, the guy, um, I can't think of the actor's name who plays, uh, uh, not Carnage. I, cause I thought it was Carnage, uh, with the limited size yeah. that I had. Uh, Riz Ahmed. Um, yes. Riz Ahmed. Thank you. Um, it's the scene where he turns into yeah. Riot, I think mm -hmm. was the name. Yes. Right. Um, so I'm ops director sitting at my terminal and he's trying to get the spaceship to launch and it, and it's, it won't launch. And so then he gets really angry and he turns into riot. And it was really cool because it, it was a big stunt day. Not mm -hmm. only did it, was it the, uh, they had him on a platform so that when he turned into riot, uh, they would actually, um, it was like a dolly uh, that just had a platform for him to stand on so that we had the visual of watching him become 10 feet tall. Oh, and wow. then they brought in this giant, uh, stunt guy who was in a green motion capture suit and he was probably seven foot tall yeah and, and then they then they put him on that thing so then you know there's this giant guy for wow. us to look at um and then the big thing was that he uh he reaches his hands up and they turn into like long swords or whatever yeah. and he clears the whole room and to watch that stunt was really cool so it was it was not that long of a day overall i mean it was it was a full day but not yeah, not in terms of the, the stuff that I had to do, but it was really cool. I mean, anytime you're on one of those hundred plus million dollar budget sets, it's, it's just fun to watch them spend their money, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, totally. Cause that was actually the first time that I don't know about you, but that was the first time I'd ever experienced what they called French hours, which means they, they don't break for lunch. Instead uh, they do a working lunch yep. and you order the food, they bring it to you and, it means that you actually make more because you get all these meal penalties depending yep. on how long your, your day is, but they save money overall because productivity stays higher and they don't go into uh, longer overtime. And um, so that was my first experience with that. Um, yeah. But yeah, for me so too. it was good. Yeah. And they, they, they did that on my day as well. And I think we were in the same set because I, I was in that, ah. that, uh, that mission control room type of set. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, my, um, yeah, I, I thought it was uh, just, insane walking on to that set because you, you when we arrive it's kind of like out in the middle of nowhere and you walk into that factory type of building and it looks kind of um like a rundown factory but then like what they built in there was uh was incredible uh and uh i actually had a similar experience in, in the in the callback too with the director kind of uh you know it was really nice uh, of, of him to take the time with with the actors and hearing that story from you and then also uh my uh adding that to my experience, I'm, I'm guessing he spent a little bit of time with every person rather than just going right into the scenes, right? Because he did the same thing. He was looking at my resume, uh, asked me, I, I forget how we got into the, on to the topic, but he may, may have also asked me about Atlanta or something like that. And I, I, I said something about how I just recently moved down to Atlanta from Ohio. And he actually, I don't think he grew up in Cleveland, but he had spent like maybe one or two years of his childhood in Cleveland. He went to Shaker uh, Heights Middle School or something. I was like, I went to Shaker Heights Middle School, and and we we got to chat a little bit about that, which was fun. And you know, in in your head as an actor, you're like, oh, this is great. <laughs> you know, this is yeah. this is good stuff. Um, but uh, but the one other difference for me with the audition was that I was reading for like one of these one of the uh, the the scientist roles. So they had they had Riz Ahmed and they had Jenny Slate, right? And then they had these two other scientists that was like that were like part of their main group of the people that worked for that company. And those two other scientists, uh, they I, I read for one of them originally. So like multi-page, multiple multi-page scenes and read for that in the original audition and at the callback and then got uh got a notice that I was pinned and I was freaking out you know <laughs> that I was pinned for this but then when I got the uh email that I was booked it was for a different role and it was for like this you know one one liner actually they, I didn't even know what it what it was for it just had the name of the role and it was different and it was working one day and you know had I not had I only auditioned for that role to begin with it would have been like, oh my God, this is crazy. Yes. Right. But it was like kind of one of those letdown bookings where you're thinking you're getting something and it's like something, it, it was something much smaller. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, it was still a, uh, an amazing experience uh, going on to that and, and, uh, and working on that set. Um, 
and then you know a, a, having that come out in theaters and right like the whole world sees a movie like that yeah and the best part is with those types of sort of tentpole films is inevitably people in your circle um and and probably not necessarily the tight circle but the people you only interact with occasionally they see it on an airplane or on you know streaming <laughs> service later on and then you get that wait hey kurt were you yeah. were you in venom you know like i saw you or they can't remember i saw you in something recently uh you were you know then they're trying yeah. to describe the scene and, and you're going oh yeah it's venom yeah venom um yeah that's, yeah that's, that's really crazy and i remember the other thing that was fun about that particular audition too was yeah they had the code name of antidote when uh oh, yeah. audition for it uh yeah. and then all the all the actors you know researching the director and all that type of stuff you like quickly quickly piece it together to yeah. of, of who what that actually was another thing i wanted to uh touch on was that so you you do um you wear many different hats not just uh actor and 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 running the taping service with brooke but uh well the two of you also uh do improv together and do improv shows together and also write and create your own content uh, as well. Uh, so what do you think uh, that type of stuff has, has, how do you think all of that has helped you in your, in your career? Because, you know, you are working when you're not working, right? You're, you're continuing to, to act and not just act, but also write and, and work in other aspects of this industry, even when you're not getting paid for it. It, uh, two, twofold. One is uh, um, if you spend the, your whole career waiting for other people to hire you, it will drive you crazy. It's what chews up and spits out a lot of actors o over their their lifetime is, you know, they come to this business for whatever reason. And then uh, that waiting, 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 not only waiting for the yes, but then you get on set and then you have to wait four hours right. before they call you the set. It's like, you know, and then it creates this huge buildup for that one little blip of being able to, to exercise your, your muscle, your craft. And so that can eat up a lot of people and spit them out. Um, and, and so given that I sort of am naturally inclined to wear those hats, uh, you know, having an engineering background and all these sort of varied interests, it, it, it just made sense for me to start creating my own work. Um, you know, always hoping that you'll, you'll be that elusive thing that goes viral, that suddenly everyone's sharing Becky and Barry, uh, the web series or whatever. Um, but honestly, when, when I first started that, it was, it was not to get all savvy, but it was sort of like a love letter to my wife. Uh, we had just been married. Mm. Um, I had told her, you, you know, one of the promises I made her is you'd never have to work as a waitress again. You know, we will figure it out. But I, cause she, she would, even though she was good at it, she would have nightmares you know, with server nightmares. Yeah. And that just, you know, as the protective male, like I, I have to <laughs> right. fix that for you. Um, and so, but then there was like this lull in, in 2010 where there was not a lot going on audition wise, booking wise. And it's sort of just kind of what grew out of that was this like, well, let's just write some stuff for ourselves mm. and shoot it. And it became very cathartic and very much this, uh, it fed the monster, right? The creative monster that is mm -hmm. always asking for more. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so it was very uh, uh, fulfilling just from that, like right? just putting it out there. Uh, but then, you know, we, we saw some sort of benefits, which is inevitably because we've already built relationships with casting directors, you, you know, you start to hear a little murmurs of you go to an audition and they just kind of reference it. Um, or, uh, or, you know, the cast director is asking the agent like, Hey, does Matt have like a, like a demo of that web series, you know, to, to be able to share for, to pitch. Oh, cool. and, uh, which I didn't like, we got three seasons in and I, I did not have a speed reel or any sort of highlight <laughs> reel. Yeah. And then suddenly when I realized that it actually had val like, Oh wait, there's actually value to this thing mm. we've been doing for three years. Mm. Um, and uh, so there was a little bit of a professional, um, I think benefit, cool. but we certainly didn't do it. We didn't do it for that reason. It was more about, Hey, we just need to, to get it out there and get this off our chest. And, 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 uh, and really was, what was really nice was the, response from the acting community yeah. um we we set out to do that series becky and barry as a you know it's it's hard to kind of like what we're doing with our channels it's it's hard to sometimes tell people what to do because there can be a lot of different ideas about the best way to act right the sure. craft of acting sure uh, but it was much easier to go oh but we can tell you what not to do um and yeah. and so that's what it was it was really like a tutorial of don't do anything that these two characters are doing 
Uh, and, you know, early on in our first season, people, when we started releasing episodes, people would, uh, would message us saying, are you basing this off of my life? <laughs> because <laughs> like, I've done that in my audition yeah. or whatever, you know? Yeah. And, and so we got a lot of good response over the years from, from just actors who uh, I think it was a little bit cathartic for them to see yeah. that, oh yeah, this, this kind of just makes me feel good for whatever reason. Um, so it's, it becomes that twofold thing of, of not waiting around for someone else to say mm-hmm. yes. But then also, you know, it is an investment. Everything in this business is, is planting seeds. And mm-hmm. who knows who knows when the seed you planted 10 years ago in Cleveland is going to bear fruit, you know, uh, so that it has that uh, that reason as well that we do it. Yeah. And it, it's so. super cool for me being relatively new to Atlanta. I mean, I've, I've been here four years now, but uh, for some of the people that have been here well before the film and television industry, you know, really uh, <clears throat> took hold here. Uh, I've seen a few episodes of Becky and Barry, and, and it's neat seeing some familiar faces to me uh, that that I've met over the past few years, but, you know, w- what they worked on uh, well before I, I came uh, to the city. And it's an, also something that I'd like to tell people, too, in that, uh, you know, working working on stuff and creating your own content with your friends uh, is such a, a a wonderful experience for one, but it's also basically that's the industry, uh, you know, from from the very lowest level of when you're just doing it with your iPhone or whatever, all the way up to the big Hollywood movies. It's just people making movies with their friends. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, look at Judd Apatow. He works with the same five to ten actors, and uh, Adam uh, Adam McKay. Exactly. Even as he's branched into drama, he's hiring the same people. And uh, Will Ferrell, when he was working with Will Ferrell, yeah, same people every time. Yeah, it's, it's, and not that it's a, you know, you can look at it in the bad, right? When you're on the outside of that club, it's horrible. Like, let me in. Right. Um, right. But then when you can, you can turn it around and become the, the president of that club and bringing in your friends. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you said that because I, somewhere in the last six months, I was just, I think I was probably depressed and was, was just looking at IMDb and I was looking at our, our Becky and Barry page and I counted and it was like, we had over a hundred credited actors on there. And that gave me so much joy to see that. And I'm just looking at all these faces going like, Oh my gosh, like it, it is. Some of these people have become the who's who of, of Atlanta. Some of them already were. Right. And, um, but it was just more than anything. We hired people, we brought people on that we knew we'd already written the role for them. It was very rare that we had to audition anybody. It was just more like, no, Hey, Mark Ashworth, you want to come be silly for a couple of days? Sure, mate. You know, and he jumps on board and then yeah. it's, it's just glorious to share that screen and to, and to watch them shine. You, you know, we started it off and we, we season one, we actually had this idea, like maybe we can play all the characters kind of like the way Tracy Ullman would be, you know, all the <laughs> yeah. different characters. Yeah. And, and we tried that actually, if you go back, like some of those uh, season one episodes are kind of like, oh man, that is, <laughs> that, that's not on the highlight reel. Yeah. Uh, but, but then we quickly realized like we brought in like Vince Bassani early on. We even tried to bring in real casting directors like Kelly Tippins and Brian Beagle mm. to, to play not themselves, but versions of themselves. Right. Yep. And, uh, and, one, and once we got a taste of that, of watching other people shine, it, we were hooked. Uh, yeah. Um, and it became so much more about, oh, who do we get to bring in this episode? Um, and, and the joy of, of being able to share that love with friends and, and even people we, we hadn't really ever worked with before and, and just say, hey, are you, are you willing? Like we got Ryan Glorioso, who's a casting director in New Orleans. We drove down there and shot an episode down there. And, and, oh, that's uh, awesome. And got him involved. And, and he, was, he was freaking out. He shows up on set. He's like, okay, when you guys asked me, I figured you were going to throw me like a line. And we had thrown him a whole page yeah. of dialogue. Yeah. And so he had freaked out, but we knew he was a former actor, which is why we, we did it. Okay. Um, but just all that, right? It was just so much fun to watch other actors do mm-hmm. their thing and, and to know that they're getting fulfillment for that day. And then when they get to see the finished product. And so, yeah, that, that, that by C3, that became really one of the main impetuses for us was mm. we just want to keep working with people. Yeah, I mean, it's just that the whole community part of it, uh, the, the, the acting and filmmaking community uh, is one of the things that kind of drew me to it when I first started up in Ohio. And then it has been uh, one of the main driving forces of, of uh, me continuing doing what I'm doing. And when I came down to Atlanta and finding the community here to be so supportive, uh, the way it has been, uh, has been, uh, you know, it's been amazing. Um, because when I first, when I first started doing this, 
No, unlike, unlike you, I didn't, I wasn't acting in high school or college or anything like that. There was really no, uh, no part of my brain that was thinking about doing this uh, as a career. And even when I started taking acting classes, I wasn't thinking about it. It was just doing it for fun. And uh, there was, when I got in my first agent, I was still working full time. My thought process was still, all right, I'm going to work full time as a software developer and, and do these auditions here and there on the side. And maybe if I book a job, it'll, I can take a day off work and, and go do something cool uh, outside of, outside of my uh, software, software job. But um, eventually it just led to, it, it was the, it was the community aspect of, uh, of the industry, of my acting classes, um, but, then, but also um, uh, finding out, like you said, with your, uh, with your architecture gig, you know, it wasn't, you know, you realized that it, it wasn't for you, like the corporate job wasn't for you. I don't think it, you know, had I not started this, I wouldn't, I don't think I ever would have realized that what I was, what I was doing wasn't for me because it was kind of just like, it was the, the, the part of me that was kind of brainwashed into, all right, I went to college for this and this is just going to be my life. Right. And I, I didn't necessarily hate my job, but I, it, I realized that there was this other thing that I was doing on a part-time basis that I actually cared about, right? I actually cared about the work. Whereas for, for my other job, it was like, all right, here's a paycheck, but that's it. Whereas here's the thing, here's something where, you know, I would do it for free, right? It, I would go and do stupid things with my friends on camera on the weekends for free. And if they paid me for it, you know, that's a bonus, Whereas, uh, whereas my, my actual job, I did not feel that way at all. So that was like, that was the part that really, you know, changed things for me. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. You know, I, I, uh, uh, in, when I first, um, started wanting to, to act like the idea, well, let's flash forward to college. Like when I was doing that, that on camera class, the idea that I could ever be paid for acting, you know, hundred bucks, 200, like, I wasn't even thinking thousands or, or becoming rich or famous or anything like that. Just the idea that you could get paid for something that you love was just, it was mind blowing. Mm -hmm. um, so that first job, that Zocor commercial that I mm -hmm. did that, that I had to lie to my boss cause I was working, you know, I was working full time at this corporate gig, yeah. but there happened to be some sort of, uh, uh, training something that was happening that I, I basically lied and said I was going to go down and get some training at this, uh, seminar or whatever. <laughs> Instead, I went to my call time down at the Georgia Dome because that's where we shot it. And uh, yeah, it's like because I loved it so much. Yeah. I mean, I got to play football, fake football on in the Georgia Dome for for you know for an afternoon. Yeah, and 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 like I you know I was completely hooked at that point. I'm like, and you're paying me? This is crazy. And this this is this shouldn't even be legal, right? For you to be able to be happy while making money, <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. Because like you said, you're you're, you're you're brainwashed into uh, by mm -hmm. either society, uh, parental units, wh whatever, mm -hmm. uh, the com combination of everything of, of it's all about, you know, planning for the 401k and the retirement. Right. And, and, uh, and I get it, you know, the everything that sort of post depression was was about that's finding the stability. Yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, I'm so happy that I found my way um, sort of that that brought the, the happiness because I used to say when like my mom would ask me, are you, you know, how are you doing? You know, when I be she'd be sending me money to, to help pay rent or whatever. Yeah. And, and I'm like, Hey, I've never been poor, but I've never been happier. Yeah. And, and that was enough for her um, to sort cause she's always been my number one fan, you know? And so that was enough for her to kind of keep supporting my, my, my journey and um, both just emotionally, but occasionally monetarily. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause if, if it's not fulfilling and, and that's the thing that uh, I think going back to an earlier discussion, uh, actors need to figure out what or reconnect to the why you know why are you doing this because mm -hmm. if you're if you're 10 years into your career and you're still um down in the dumps because you've not graduated above a co-star level mm -hmm. or you you got that guest star and then you're right back to doing co-stars mm -hmm. um or, or whatever like if, if if that is really plaguing people I, it, it's a good time to sort of reconnect well like what's the most important thing is it red carpet well then move to LA and get a manager and really start doing the grind uh, mm -hmm. and start, start playing that game. Cause it's a very different game 
Mm -hmm. uh, if that's if that's your goal, you know, versus if it's just artistic fulfillment and wanting to be a, a journeyman actor for the rest of your life. Well, you can do that here in Atlanta for sure. And um, and that was something that I think happened. Uh, I had a recalibration during the pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. sort of sort of a, a reality check of not not that I was uh, had these dreams of, of red carpets. I mean, we all have those uh, those visions and dreams and hopes. Uh, I had been pretty realistic for the last several years. Uh, mm -hmm. But there was this realization like, oh, if I'm not careful, I'm going to become that bitter actor who is mm -hmm. always looking for something to go wrong, who is always coming up with excuses for why, you know, this industry sucks. Mm -hmm. And it was it was a real uh, moment for me where I just kind of I flipped the script on myself. And, and then it became like, I hope I get to book again so that I can sort of, you know, test out this new mentality that I have. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, but, but I sort of reconnected with that. Why? Yeah. And I think, I think going back to the first question, I think that is part of also what drove me to want to do the, the YouTube channel, uh, was like, you know, I just, I just want to create, I just want to put stuff yeah. out there. Yeah, that's great. So. Um, and, uh, another, another part of, um, another thing that you're doing other than all the stuff we've already mentioned <laughs> you got quite a bit you and Brooke both have quite a bit on your plate but you guys also teach uh, so uh let's talk a little bit about um so maybe instead of uh going directly into what you're teaching so the 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 question that or or the the thing that we hear a lot from really industry-wide from agents and casting directors is that you have to know your type um mm -hmm. and uh, on top of that, uh, knowing your type, then also bringing yourself to the role and bringing yourself to each audition. We've heard that so many times. And a lot of times people find that hard to, they, it's hard to grasp what they exactly mean by that. Uh, mm -hmm. So a lot of what you guys teach focuses specifically on that particular topic. So uh, you want to share what that whole uh, arena is all about? Yeah, you know, well, uh, one good analogy for type and, you know, those words type and brand get thrown around and, and mm -hmm. it becomes actually a, a pretty polarizing topic for actors and teachers uh, specifically. I, I see a lot of stuff thrown out there by either casting directors who are doing some teaching or coaching and, and then teachers. Uh, uh, some are teaching type and brand and then some are saying don't like that is limiting. It is putting you in a box. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I'll pre uh, briefly define type and brand like type would be a soda. Soda is a type, it's a type of beverage. Whereas brand is Coca-Cola, it's Pepsi, it's Dr. Pepper, it's something very, very specific. Mm -hmm. And so type, you know, uh, we both would fit into sort of that, that nebulous type of 40s, any ethnicity, mm -hmm. um, and or 30s to 40s, any, any ethnicity. Like, so if we're gonna, if a cop roll comes across the, the, the inbox of, of Houghton, uh, we might both get submitted for cop because mm -hmm. it, all they care about is 30s or 40s, uh, any ethnicity, male, whatever. And, and so we fit that type. Mm -hmm. um, but the brand is what starts to get hyper specific about, well, what's the, what's the, uh, what's the specificity of, of how Kurt's going to play cop number one versus how Matt's going to play it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the different uh, behaviors that are sort of naturally within me. Are different than yours and so my cop is going to just if i if i allow myself to be authentic it's going to come across very differently than yours and that's where actors get into trouble they get so um focused on the type itself and then they they imagine this image of what hollywood thinks of when they think of cop right that then they're you know you're trying to be you're trying to slip into uh, here's an analogy you're trying to slip in the clothing that wasn't tailored for you instead of letting the clothing be tailored to you right let mm, the role come to you yeah just you, you know you put this thing on and then tailor it to yourself so that you look good wearing that new jacket or whatever right. um and and so to not let yeah to not let type uh, get so dominant and and to the point where you're trying to actually abandon your brand that maybe you've not really even discovered yet um because you're trying to become something you're not and mm -hmm. and this all relates to the other sort of buzzword that we use which is authenticity and uh, we, you know, we're part of this this process called the Sam Christensen image process, and it's it's all designed to basically take actors or anybody else. This can this is relevant for all humans, uh, but actors tend to gravitate toward it the most. But to be able to strip away all the extra stuff you're trying to do in life to manage your your brand, mm -hmm. when really it's just like the thing that is actually you, that authentic core of who you are, is enough, especially as an actor. And that's exactly what they want. 
And back to that idea of when you walk in the room and like John Stewart's already sort of in his head doing this, like he's here. Mm -hmm. This the guy is here. You know, I saw his tape. Just don't mess it up, Kurt. You know, he's thinking in his head. And um, because your brand is already sort of oozing out of you, it's already being received by John Stewart on the other side of that table. And and it's all these things that um, we as humans are really good at at noticing. Um, I saw a study once that by the time you're 12, depending on unless you lived on a farm your whole life, but if you live in a suburban urban area, by the time you're 12 or 13, you'll have significant interactions with a million people. And what that does to your brain is it makes you really, really, really good at when you see someone for the very first time, you're taking in so much information about who they are and, and their, their brand or their, or, you know, who, what it is you're getting off of them, but it's a lot of stuff that sits in the, um, uh, did I lose you? Okay, cool. Yeah. It's, it's, it's stuff that sits in the subconscious and we don't, uh, because we're told don't judge a book by its cover. So we kind of actually push a lot of that stuff down and we try not to be certain things. We're trying to run away from certain parts of our personality because we don't perceive them as favorable or castable. And it's right. like, no, no, no. The, the thing you were born with that then, uh, nurture, you know, the nature and nurture thing, the thing that you're born with combined with the environment you grew up in, that is an amazing complex human being that, uh, that is needed, right? As a storyteller, you are needed to tell a story, mm -hmm. to tell many stories. And what actors get so caught up in, either as a result of their training or their ideas of Hollywood or whatever, mm -hmm. is that they need to become something. And it's like, no, 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 no. You just need to strip all that away and just be yourself. And that's why you hear that refrain over and over again. No, 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 just, just be yourself. We just want an authentic read. But again, you're trying to take all of that experience and all your notions and all your training, and you're trying to squeeze it into that one line audition. And then it's just, it's too much. It's actually really uh, unattractive. Um, and what they really want is just you, the human, to show up in, in that role and to let that role sort of fall onto you as, as opposed to you trying to step into what you heard the previous guy doing in the room before you. And wow, they really responded to Kurt. I guess I got to do it like Kurt, you know, and then I'm trying to do your inflections uh, of how you said mm -hmm. the lines. And then it's like, what is this guy doing? Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's a lot of that of just trying to strip away our, our ideas of, of who we think we are um, or who we're, who we're trying to be and, and sort of putting on stuff and, and trying to mask stuff and hide stuff and, it's like, no, 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 let's just, let's just let all of it, that, all that stuff that you were born with combined with whatever nurture did to you and, and celebrate that and, and let that become your brand. And then the result is for people who go through the process is that they walk into auditions room, audition rooms with a relaxation, which turns into confidence and they sense that immediately, right? Um, on the other side of the table, because, because they're nervous. <laughs> they're nervous about, they need the answer, right? They need to cast mm -hmm. this darn thing. Mm -hmm. And if you walk in with that sense of, Hey, I got this, mm -hmm. um, that puts them at ease and that makes them want to work with you. Even if you're not right for this role, they're already thinking of you kind of like, that's what happened with Venom. You yeah. walked in for that role. For some reason, the other actor fit the bill yep. better. Um, but that guy's thinking, but I still want to work with Kurt. Yeah. What else we got? Uh, let's just, yeah, let's put him here. Let's create this role, right? Let's, let's do whatever we need to do. Um, so it's really about letting the actor become their fullest authentic self by um, we reveal it to them sort of through a lot of exercises and, and data gathering. Uh, and then we, we, we kind of gift it back to them uh, to say here, um, this is you. Uh, it's been you the whole time, but we've just sort of made it Claritin clear. You know, like those Claritin yeah. commercials where it's like, it's the same image, but we just made it clearer and more vibrant. Right. And now you, you just feel better about it. Um, it's, it's hard to do the nutshell elevator pitch uh, of that, but it's, it's really just about that, about getting you to, to a point where you fully understand in a, in a hyper-specific way. Um, uh, because like I said, we have these intuitions of, of who we are and how the world works, but if you can't put language to it, if you can't actually specify it, then you're missing out on a, uh, on a lot of it. So. Yeah, and I think that's, that's great. And, then, and there's another teacher here in Atlanta, Rob Pralgo, who... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, harps on the same thing in his classes. He, he talks about how you don't become the character, the character becomes you and how you really have to believe in that. And, and, it, and I agree with you. It's a lot of um, our ideas of what acting is when we're growing up before we start really learning the craft is that, okay, actors 
become other characters, right? Um, every actor can can uh, play every role because they they can uh, they they can train to turn into you know other people. And on one of my recent videos, maybe a week or two ago, I asked people to type in the comments and say, you know, what's uh, what's your reason for wanting to become an actor? And a lot of people had, you know, clearly these are people who are, who are newer. Um, a lot of people had that type of answer in that I love the idea of becoming someone else. You know, I love the idea of um, completely changing into a different person or something like that. Um, and that's, yeah. that's, I think that's a, a very common for people to think that way when we're first getting started and even, you know, well into our careers and, and, to uh, strip that thought process away is not necessarily very easy. We can be told, but uh, to mm-hmm. learn it isn't, isn't super easy. Right. Yeah. And yeah. And, and it's, it's a little bit semantics, but it's like um, you're not becoming other people. What you're really doing is society only allows you to act within a certain box for that to be acceptable behavior in public mm-hmm. in, in greater society. And so really what it is, is you're, you're intuitively aware of all those other corners of your personality emotionally and, and otherwise that you just don't get to do. You're not allowed to do it uh, in public. It just wouldn't be acceptable. Yeah. And these characters just give you a chance to be that version of you that you don't get to do off. It's why people love playing villains because we all sort of uh, know that there is this capability of humans right. to be villainous and evil but society doesn't let us do that. Uh, yeah. but hey, if you, if you give me the excuse to, <laughs> and now I'm actually getting paid to explore that side of my personality. Well, that's, that's, that's a grand old time right there. Um, but yeah, it's just the semantics of, yeah, I'm not trying to become some idea of another human being. I'm just accessing that ability within myself to authentically portray that thing. Um, and then you're just giving me words to say, you know, and a costume yeah. to wear. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah that's great. So if people are interested in uh, learning about learning more about that Sam Christensen process uh, through Get Taped, how can they find out more about it? Uh, on our website, uh, gettaped.com, uh, there is a, a tab for Sam Christensen and we, we lay out the, what the process is. It's a four day intensive weekend. Uh, so we show sort of like the commitment in terms of hours, the, the background. There's some links to uh, our YouTube. Ch- we have a sister channel. Uh, for the Sam Christians and stuff. So we have a couple of videos there. Mm. Uh, so, so people can do a, a lot of sort of self-guided research uh, through that. And then they can contact us directly if they, if they want to learn more or, or sign up for a future. Uh, we do preview events where, uh, over Zoom where we will go through the history of who Sam Christensen was, how did he come to this process and uh, what benefits an actor or someone from a different profession, what they might gain from the process. Because again, it's hard to do the elevator pitch. And even when you explain it over the course of an hour long preview, sometimes people still have the questions at the end of like, so I'm still not really sure what, what, what I'm gonna get from it. Yeah. And then when, the, when students inevitably go through the process, we just finished a weekend this past weekend. And when they go through it, they inevitably go, oh, now I know why it was so hard for you to describe. Right. Because I, you know, my, my wife asked me about it and I didn't know really how to explain what, what just happened. Uh, and it's because it's an intensely personal journey of discovery of this, of this brand, of this authenticity. Mm. So it's really hard to just talk about it in general terms of, uh, because what you're going to get from it is going to be different than me um, Mm -hmm. based on who we are and where, where we are in life. So it becomes very hard to describe, but so we have these free events that we allow people to come to and ask questions and learn about the process. And, um, but if they go to gettape.com, yeah, they can see all that there. So you have a preview available via zoom, but the actual weekend intensive is in person, right? Uh, it used to be, but now with the pandemic, we're, we're alternating. We actually did our first in-person last weekend in six yeah. months. Um, and that went really well. I mean, we were all wearing masks and face shields and we kept six feet apart and because nothing about the workshop is interactive. You don't have to get close to anybody for any reason. Okay. Um, so it was a very safe, uh, uh we felt it was very safe. Uh, no, no more dangerous than going to Publix or Kroger, you know, mm-hmm. to get some groceries and people are passing by inches from your, you know, from you. Um, but this weekend and, and in the future, we're going to continue to offer them over Zoom. Um, and because we found back in May of 2020 that um, doing it over Zoom loses nothing. Mm. Some people aren't convinced. They think, well, no, I, I'd rather do it in person. 
Yeah. And, and I respect that, which is why we're going to have that option, of course, because we love doing it in person. But because it's so personal and because this, this stuff, this thing that we call our brand, we think it's something like, no, 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 you got to get to know me and all the complicated person who I am. And we do. We get to know you very uh, on a very comprehensive level. But so much of it is being received just in a two-dimensional image. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And it's why cast directors are so frustrated because they get so much from your headshot that if you don't walk in sort of uh, selling that same thing, th then they're really thrown off by that. They don't mm -hmm. like it. Um, mm -hmm. Whether it's because you wore too much makeup or you, you know, you tried to create a really interesting headshot as a photographer, I'm sure you've seen plenty of actors give you the, the, like the too much look like, mm -hmm. yeah, let's, okay, let's, let's do that. But then let's maybe just, you know, you try to catch them accidentally doing something authentic yeah, yeah. Um, because they're trying too hard. And, and so if the actor walks in, not looking like the brand that they're selling in that headshot, it's uh, that's very bad because then, then they're confused um, with what you're selling, you know? Yeah. So. Um, well, that's, that's great to hear that you're also offering it via Zoom because I didn't know that you were doing that. So basically, uh, anybody time, watching this from anywhere all, all can stuff. sign up uh, for the One final the question class, I, right? I, I have for yeah. you. Yeah, I, I mean, like, this, this weekend, we, we uh, have somebody from LA, somebody everybody from Colorado, so we can chat with. Awesome. Now, if someone, like, if you, if someone from like London joined, in an joined, alternate universe be where you aren't an actor with the time zone stuff, they'd be possibly in the middle of the night still on the Zoom call, but... But other hey, than when I did zone, my um, when I did my YouTube live, well, there were people uh, from all in the interest over, of, of improv, world, where you so, just say the first um, thing that comes to I'm your mind. Sure, the first thing that popped in my mind I'm was soccer. Sure coach. There were some people that were um, interesting. Uh, yeah. Have you coached soccer <laughs> and, before? No, uh, <laughs> but that's why it's an alternate universe. But uh, right. very very athletic, and I think hmm. taking all that creativity off the table, I think I'd still, as an introvert, I think I would still have that because I am a textbook introvert, uh, believe it or not. Uh, but I would still have that desire to sort of be outward facing, affecting other people. I do love working with kids like, and by soccer coach, I mean like little league okay. uh, or, or like uh, teenagers. Cause when I have taught uh, th there's a lot of um, fulfillment that I got out of working with, you know, kids when they're in that formidable, those years where they mm -hmm. can still be shaped they're, They, they still respect authority, but they're also discovering who they are. Mm. Um, so it would be, have to be something that I think that would still uh, be in that realm. And so that's, so soccer coach is my, my final answer. Have you ever played a soccer coach or any type of coach? Uh, well, yes. Uh, in a commercial for Hibbit sports, I, yeah. it was like this little web thing. It was so funny. I got to, I got to play coach Hibbit. It was almost all improv. Um, we, we shot some actual commercials, but then it was a live Twitter day. It was so fun. We just sat there and had people tweet questions and then we would shoot little 15 second video responses, you know, in this character of Coach Hibbit. I had, I was clean shaven, but they gave me a fake mustache and the <laughs> aviators. And, and so I was like that, I was like the, I was like Ted Lasso before Ted Lasso, essentially. Okay. Um, which is that Jason Sudeikis show on Apple yep. TV. Yeah. Um, and, and so I've played him and I have to think a little bit harder. I don't know that I've actually played any other coaches though. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully something else comes down the line. We're speaking it to the universe. Cast Matt as exactly. a soccer coach at some point. <laughs> All right, man. Um, well, that's it for today. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, uh, check out gettape.com for basically everything we just talked about. Uh, look up Matt on IMDb, Matthew Cornwell, and you can see all the stuff that he was in and, and check out some of his movies and shows that he's been in. Um, otherwise, uh, what's a uh, social media that they can find you at? Uh, Instagram is Matthew.Cornwell. Facebook is just well, just search me on, on that. Uh, you know, when I created my account years ago, I don't even remember what my actual <laughs> handle is on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Matthew.Cornwell on Instagram is, is the easiest way to find me. Great. Okay, buddy. Uh, well, we'll end, the ch end this chat the same way we do on both of our channels. So I hope to see you on set. Yeah, see you on set, Kurt. All right, that is it for today's video. I want to thank Matt one more time for joining me and thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments below. And until next time, keep practicing, keep learning, and I hope to see you on set one day.